men are different, set apart from other human beings. They have sworn to accept their death unconditionally whenever orders or circumstances demand it. And they have taken that oath, given that promise, in the name of the rest of us. They have offered to spare us the horror of confronting the face of battle. War can show a face of glory to the world. No spectacle so touches the emotions as the sight of soldiers arrayed for ceremony. A column of young men in fine uniform turns heads and stirs hearts. Whether they parade to bury a hero, celebrate a victory, or, as on this day, state their readiness to die in the terrible environment of a battlefield. Just south of Brussels is the battlefield of Waterloo. It's an appropriate place from which to observe the changing face of battle. For here, battlefields, ancient and modern, overlap each other like scales of armor. 50 miles northwest lies the sea. 50 miles southeast are the steep, wooded hills of the Ardennes. Waterloo stands astride the corridor in between, a natural invasion route for armies of all ages. At its center rises the Lion Mound, Belgium's monument to the Allied victory and a unique place to look back at the experience of battle. Some miles to the south of me, over there, more than 2,000 years ago, Caesar and his Roman legions fought the Nervii on the banks of the Sambre. Further to the west were the battlefields of Agincourt and Crecy, where English archers cut down the flower of French chivalry in the 14th and 15th centuries. And not far to the east lies Ramillies, where Marlborough and his cavalry won a famous victory a hundred years before Waterloo. And a hundred years after Waterloo, it was the German army of von Kluck that passed this way, bound for the mud and trenches of Flanders. In the early days of May 1940, from here, you could very well have heard the rumble of the tanks of the 3rd Panzer Division, the northern flank of the German advance that introduced to a startled world the revolutionary concept of Blitzkrieg, the Lightning War. So this lion mound is a military vantage point in more than one way. In this program, we can view the actions that took place at different stages throughout the course of that eventful day and compare them directly with the equivalent experience of other battles in other centuries. For war does change, even if the human emotions it touches remain constant and universal. June the 18th, 1815, Napoleon, on the morning of Waterloo, reviewed his army from the ridge which runs opposite the Lion Mound. While Napoleon showed himself to his soldiers, Wellington's men were marching to the ridge on the other side of the valley. Men become soldiers for all sorts of reasons. Roman soldiers served mainly for pay. The word soldier comes from the name of the coin they received. The Muslim soldiers of the Caliphs of Islam were enlisted as slaves of the state. At the start of America's Civil War, the North relied on volunteers. Tommies of the British Empire soldiered for a shilling a day. Kitchener's armies went to the First World War for patriotism and comradeship. The French went because they owed that duty to the Republic. 
the Germans marched to the Second World War in obedience to the will of the Führer. For the average American conscript who fought the Germans and the Japanese, the aim was to get the job done and get back home. And the British regulars who went to the Falklands were also doing their job as highly trained professionals. Dawn at Waterloo, and soldiers on both sides waited with mixed feelings for the impending battle. One 16-year-old British infantry officer, George Keppel, spent what he called the dreary interval between daylight and the first cannon shot, constantly wishing that the fight was fought. The urge to have it over and done with seems to afflict all soldiers on the eve of battle. Fear gnaws at them fear of death, of wounds, of showing fear to their comrades. Men draw close, compulsively cleaning their weapons and trying to keep at bay that silence that falls on each little group. You get that waiting, that fear, not fear in itself, but fear of being frightened. You, you are waiting for something to happen. You don't know what's going to happen. In yourself, you're, you're waiting, you, you think, am I going to be frightened? It goes through your mind. I don't want to be frightened, because if anything goes wrong and I'm scared, I might let my mates down. I was uh, particularly nervy. I'd clean my gun, go off to the toilet, have a meal, have a pick out of the bully beef tin that I didn't really want. But once I was committed, I was a totally different fellow. I could, I could carry on then. Once I got moving, I was good. But the night before, no good at all. I went from acute fear the day I got off the plane that landed there to chronic fear that stayed with me the entire time I was there. Acute fear is when you're someone, you feel like someone's gonna take your life right away and you're absolutely like this. Uh, ready to respond, and chronic fear becomes kind of a knot in the pit of your stomach. It's there all the time. Um, it never quite ever goes away. It's common language. You get butterflies, you know. They've been working overtime. Even with the power, you carry a parachute on your back. You don't know what will happen. Will it open? Will you arrive safely down? But as soon as the plane left the ground, it was calm then, yeah? But the men, never never calm down because they did now once the doors open and the green light comes on once it, uh, the order came stand up well i mean it was a feeling like either you fill your pants or you jump out i think i knew i would be frightened but Part of that fear is the physical fear of being hit, actually down. And part of it is failing. And the two sort of balance against each other and help you go on. So prior to it, you're aware of it. I mean, we stood together prior to moving around to the battle in a group. And we all stood close and sort of mumbled together and sort of got confidence. And that, that was fear. But there was also anticipation. You know, it's the one thing we'd all trained for. No one would have not wanted to be there, but nobody really wanted to be there, so it was a very mixed feeling. You've got to get it done fast, so the only way to do it is to get in there. It's just waiting around, it's the worst part. We're all just waiting, waiting to go. So we just want to get there and get over and done with. It was like going to a picnic. Everyone was, was happy. It was really amazing that uh, it wasn't like going into a battle at the time until uh, the first shots were fired across the bow of our ships. Then the picnic was no longer there. 
then came the war. The main action at Waterloo opened with an artillery bombardment when Napoleon's grand battery of 80 guns fired for over half an hour across the valley separating the two armies and the British artillery replied. Probably more than 2,000 rounds of ammunition were fired in that interval by guns like this one. This happens to be British. It's a bronze six-pounder, meaning that its solid shot weighed six pounds. But it also fired loose shot, canister or grape like this, which was designed to have the same effect upon massed infantry as a shotgun cartridge on a flock of birds. To aim, the number one would simply squint down the barrel. If you wanted to raise or lower, elevate or depress, you could use this. But if you wanted to traverse, he simply used raw muscle. He picked up the hand spike and he pushed and shoved until he was happy. Now, the range of this light six-pounder would have been up to 1,200 yards, and the French heavier 12-pounders across the valley up to a mile. At long range, and that's what it was, they'd have been using this solid shot and using it with horrific effect. During the central stage of the battle, the inner skilling regiment was kept under direct fire by the French artillery at a range of 700 yards for four hours. When it marched off, it left 450 of its 750 officers and men dead or wounded in the positions. Ensign Leek of the 52nd Regiment actually saw the ball leave the muzzle of a French gun after its crew had swabbed, loaded and rammed. And he watched it come apparently straight at his face. Well, he debated whether he should duck and decided that honor forbade that, so he drew himself to attention. Well, the ball took off the heads of the four men next to him. No wonder the infantry feared and hated artillery. It was already the great killer of the battlefield. As one war followed another during the century after Waterloo, artillery grew in power and impact. During the American Civil War, it was the terrible guns the survivors of battle recalled. I was never so tired of shelling in my life, wrote one veteran. I hate cannon. And now artillery began to destroy townscapes as well. In the battle with the rebellious Paris Communards of 1871, the government guns tore down street after street, transforming the center of the French capital into a field of ruins, leaving us with images we might well associate with the devastation of the bombing of World War II. But it was during the First World War that artillery revealed its newfound power. A century of invention had turned Wellington's smooth bore cannon into engines of mass destruction of every size. From the small field guns, like the British 18-pounder, and its French equivalent, the 75mm, which fired 20 rounds a minute, to the massive railway guns that could reach miles into the enemy's positions. Guns like these made the First World War truly an artillery war. The great trench offensives were preceded by bombardments of unparalleled weight and intensity. Before the Third Battle of Ypres in 1917, four and a quarter million shells were fired over 19 days. Even delivering such bombardments was an experience no gunners could ever forget. I don't think I have ever known anything as impressive as the opening of a really full-scale barrage. Suddenly, bang on zero hour, the whole place just comes alive with a terrific surge with all the shells that are traveling through the air and the way on the skyline as far as the eye can see right and left is absolutely lit up with pinpoints a most impressive sight yet the gun crews rarely saw what their shells hit it was the forward observers who witnessed the fall of shot i remember when we were having our h and charters from albert and there's a village called earls which was more or less intact behind the German lines. Uh, it distressed me enormously because it's a very pretty little village uh, with houses on both sides of the road, and I only had to fire four rounds, one, two, three, four, to see the spire of the church collapse and the whole of the village flattened out. Four rounds only from our eight-inch houses. 
It was artillery that was the great killer of the First World War. It was also the great demoralizer. Soldiers of all nations loathed shellfire's arbitrary and impersonal character. A young British officer wrote, terror and death coming from far away seemed much more ghastly than a hail of fire for people we could see and with whom we could come to grips. It was a fatalistic situation. Imagine terrible weather, the ground outside churns to an impossible morass, uh, and the din, the noise and the concussion uh, just making the air vibrate. You really felt, well, there's nothing we can do to escape. It's a question of time before your number's on the, on the bit that comes along. Artillery did not only destroy men, it also devastated the surface of the battlefield on which they moved and tried to survive. It turned farms and villages to heaps of shapeless rubble, fields to wasteland, forests to tangled heaps of brushwood. Above all, it turned the soil into mud, mud so deep and liquid that it swallowed horses and drowned men. This gentle slope is the rise that leads to Passchendaele, the tiny village outside Ypres, so long and savagely contested that its name has come to stand for the Holocaust of the First World War. This is how it looks today, and as it must have looked in 1914. But in the autumn of 1917, it had come to resemble the surface of the moon. This sequence of aerial photographs record how, as crater came to overlap crater during the relentless bombardment, houses, hedges, even field boundaries were progressively erased until Passchendaele existed only as a name on a map, a terrible tribute to the power that artillery exerts on the modern battlefield. At one o'clock in the afternoon, the Battle of Waterloo had been raging for two hours. It was at its fiercest here around Hougoumont, the old fortified manor house and farm standing just in front of the British right wing. Wellington had occupied it and loopholed it for defense. It's still an impressive building today. In 1815, it was even stronger and more extensive, extensive enough to contain nearly two battalions of British foot guards. Wellington had garrisoned it strongly because he thought its possession essential to secure his right wing. The French were equally keen to take it from him. Indeed, they opened the battle by an attack on Hougoumont, and the fight there quickly became a battle within a battle, persisting throughout the morning and afternoon. At one stage, the French actually broke into the central courtyard, but by sheer weight of numbers, the British were able to force the gate shut behind them. The intruders were then hunted down and every single one of them killed except a young drummer boy. Around the middle of the day, some of the buildings here were set on fire by shells from French howitzers, and this introduced another dimension of horror to the fighting in the farm. The roofs of the barn and the manor crashed in a sheet of flame on top of the wounded who were lying inside, and many of them were burned to death. The whole of this courtyard was like an oven. Everyone was scorched by flying embers. The old manor house, which used to stand over there, burnt down in the end, and all that's left is this little chapel. But in spite of all this, and despite the ferocity and courage of the French attack, the walls of this courtyard were never breached. The wood outside was lost, the buildings often completely surrounded, but at the end of the battle, the foot guards were standing firm. Throughout history, it has always been a hard and bloody task to capture a fortified position from resolute defenders. To capture Malta in 1565, the Ottoman Sultan, Suleiman, sent a mighty armada of 181 ships and an army of 30,000 men. The island was defended by 700 knights of St. John and 9,000 hired soldiers. Yet four months later, the Turks, who had lost two-thirds of their men in the siege, retired in ignominious defeat to Constantinople. 400 years later, American Marines were brought in to recapture the city of Hue, Vietnam's ancient capital, seized by the North Vietnamese army in their Tet Offensive. In the heart of the city lies its citadel built by French colonial engineers in the 19th century and designed only to withstand gunpowder and round shot. Against it, the Americans deployed all the firepower of a mighty modern army.
Despite these ferocious assaults, the defenders held out for 25 days behind the citadel's walls and moat. Until in the end, it was carried by the oldest of methods, direct assault by infantrymen. Where I've been over here four months, and we were always in the rice paddies, in the jungles, patrols, something like that. This was something new. It's like broke into like any city, like blocks, uh, concrete buildings. And the thing was, you never know what's going to happen every time you turned a corner or every time you entered a building. We got in the habit of throwing grenades and firing first before we went anywhere. And in some instances, it was no more than five feet that you had to shoot, shoot the enemy. He was trying to shoot you. This went on building by building. We had to take it. There was no such thing as trying to clear a block out, you know, just for the platoon. We broke down the five-man teams. You know. It, it was just chaos, you know. Just whoever shot fastest made it. And which uh, quite a few did make it on our side, you know. Our job was to take the city. I can remember a huge wall around it. Uh, most of the city was taken at the time, but the citadel was left. say half of the company had serious enough wounds. The final count of men that were killed in my platoon were five out of my platoon alone. And I think out of our company, I believe it was 15. The Citadel finally fell, but the defenders had already slipped away. By early afternoon at Waterloo, it was now the turn of the massed ranks of infantry to go into action. Wellington's men awaited their attack, lying down in the dead ground behind the crest of the ridge or crouching behind hedge banks, muskets at the ready, until the French columns came within range. Most of the infantry carried muskets like this. Now this is a brown bess. A soldier had to stand up to put powder and ball down the barrel and then ram them home with this. So he usually fired standing, and a well-trained soldier could fire two shots a minute. But it was not an accurate weapon. If its heavy lead ball hit home, it was deadly. But you'd be lucky to hit a man over 70 yards away. So it was really only useful against large targets. The French infantry, who made the first attack, presented just such a target. They advanced across the valley in massed battalion columns, 25 men deep and 200 wide. They halted 40 yards down this slope and began to deploy into line. At this point, the British infantry, four Scottish regiments, discharged their muskets, taking the French by surprise. They then fixed bayonets and burst through the hedge. Here on the ridge, eight or 9,000 English and French fought a violent hand-to-hand -hand battle. The French, impeded by the press of their own numbers, soon broke and fled, and were chased back across the valley by the Scots dragoons to the cry of Scotland forever. The experience of battle for the infantrymen had altered very little in the centuries before Waterloo. For the Persians, who fought the Lydians at Sardis in 546 BC, combat took a form which would have been familiar to Julius Caesar or Frederick the Great of Prussia. Once the two sides made contact, it was a business of push and shove with edged weapons. The fight was always short because the muscular effort required was too exhausting to be sustained for long. Gunpowder scarcely varied the essential nature of a foot soldier's experience. He now had to endure cannon and musket shot instead of the arrow cloud. But since black powder weapons were so inaccurate, he still had to close with the enemy to deliver a decision. So, after the opening exchange of projectiles, it was hand-to-hand -hand combat that decided who gave way and who won the day. What did change the infantryman's experience of battle, and change it catastrophically, was the appearance of quick-firing artillery. The range and accuracy of the rifle, 
and the inescapable blanket fire of the machine gun. Disastrously, no army had appreciated by the outbreak of the Great War their impact on massed infantry formations. The British soldiers who left their trenches on the first day of the Somme walked into a scythe of machine gun fire. A survivor remembered, by the time I'd gone 10 yards, there seemed to be only a few men left around me. By the time I'd gone 20 yards, I seemed to be on my own. And then I was hit myself. Everybody had wondered who was going to get killed. How many of us will come back? I'd rather get killed than get badly wounded and lie out there and die. And the, the thousand and one things, trying to picture how your mother and dad would take it when the telegram arrives to say, the Secretary of State regrets to inform you, so and so and so and so. They came over, not in extended order like we advanced, but they came over en masse, just like a crowd coming out of a football match. And it wasn't a matter of aiming, it was just a matter of loading and pulling the trigger. 60,000 soldiers were hit on that July morning. 20,000 died. The disaster the infantrymen suffered on the Somme introduced a new experience for men on the battlefield. When not attacking, they found shelter below ground. When they did attack, they did so in single file to present as small a target as possible. In the years since 1918, the infantryman has had to fight to survive on every sort of battlefield. He has sweated through the jungles and rainforests of Southeast Asia. He stormed through the deserts of North Africa. He's suffered on the exposed beaches of the Pacific Islands. He's endured the unforgiving snows of the Russian steppe. He struggled in the mountains of Italy and the Balkans. He's battled through the hedgerows of Northern Europe. But despite today's technology, he still remains essentially a foot soldier. All of a sudden, you're the most important man. You're as good as any fighter pilot or all the other guys. You're at the front and everyone's doing what you want to do. And that's a good feeling, apart from the fact that you are at the front. Unlike everybody else, what you're gonna fight with is you and a gun, which they, they give you. And everything else, you carry on your back. And you're always cold, you're always wet, you're always frightened, and you're always completely shattered all the time. You're never comfortable. And then you have to beat all of those things to do the thing that they want you to do, which is to go in and smack the enemy down hard and finish the job. You can bombard it, you can fire at it from aircraft, you can do everything to the target. But the only time you win is to have us lot, the grunts of the world, standing there saying this is now our piece of real estate. All the technology is great, but there's nothing that can really help us do that last final 400 meters to finish the job. By the afternoon of Waterloo, Wellington knew that he had a full-scale battle on his hands and that his outcome rested on his powers of command. In one important sense, Waterloo resembled every other battle from the earliest times to the end of the 19th century. The commander could see the whole battlefield, or most of it anyway, from one spot, and he could deliver his orders to his subordinates without delay. But in fact, Wellington was rarely in one spot for long. He was constantly in motion, riding always to where danger threatened worst, sometimes even sitting out the charges in the middle of one of his infantry squares. He could ride from the center of the line to the right flank in about 10 minutes. And despite the massive amount of smoke that covered the battlefield, he was able to keep much of it directly in view. If he saw something that needed attention, but he could not go himself, he would hastily write his orders on slips of parchment like this and dispatch them by messenger. Today, orders flow from the point of command by means undreamt of in Wellington's century. And the information on which orders are based flows into the point of command in a profusion with which no single human being can deal. A modern military headquarters can cover a continent. 
and its field of action is the world. Here at North American Air Defense Headquarters, they keep watch for signs of missile attack on the United States. They receive their intelligence from radar, reconnaissance satellite, and seabed sound surveillance. This unending stream of facts is processed by the banks of computers and the results displayed on screens. It's on these electronic messages that today's commanders must base their decisions. By mid-afternoon at Waterloo, the French had tried both artillery and infantry against the Allied line. It still refused to break. So at about four o'clock, Marshal Ney, Napoleon's battlefield commander, decided to commit his cavalry. Soon, an immense mass of horsemen could be seen approaching from beyond La Belle Alliance, that white building in the distance behind me. The dense columns of cavalry, 12 ranks deep, 500 men abreast, advanced up this slope, watched in awestruck silence by the British they were about to assault. It was a spectacle scarcely ever to be seen again, a sea of steel and horse flesh and brilliant uniforms flowing in waves across the folds of the valley. But the most unexpected thing about the attack was that it was cavalry alone. There were no French foot soldiers to be seen. Yet against cavalry, infantry had an almost impregnable defense to form squares. As long as the British infantry kept steady, properly formed and cool enough to continue firing, they were unbreakable. So as the French cavalry came over the ridge at a canter, they were cut down by grape shot from the British artillery batteries and musket fire from the squares. Time and again they attacked, charging up the slope, round and past the squares, then retreating down the hill where they reformed to charge again. Soon the ridge around the British line was so covered with the dead and wounded men and horses that the cavalry could no longer ride over it. Twelve times the French charged, but when after an hour and a half they finally withdrew, the British squares still stood unbroken. Ceremony is the only duty that remains to the surviving mounted regiments. The role they once played strikes the onlooker as utterly archaic, but in their great days it was crucial. The mounted scout found the enemy. The skirmisher kept him in play while the general assembled his forces. And at the crisis of battle, the shock regiments destroyed him. Find, fix, destroy. These functions were and remain essential. Today, they are performed by the tank. The tank was an invention made necessary by the stalemate of the First World War, but one so primitive that it achieved little. By 1940, however, tanks were transformed, and with them came a new form of war, Blitzkrieg. Its impact was shattering, demoralizing those it did not destroy. Came to Holland, Berlin, France, but as soon as we crossed the Belgian border up, uh, near Arras, the roads absolutely day and night been shock a block with people running away, leaving everything behind, leaving the home, and as soon as they saw convoys coming, everybody shot because the people been frightened. It was not only the civilian victims of Blitzkrieg who found the appearance of tanks terrifying. All of a sudden, we realized they were enemy tanks. I said, my God, this is it. What can you do against a tank? They have machine guns. They can run over you. That's the thing you think about more than anything else, is a tank running over your body. There was no place to go, absolutely no place. I felt like an ant on top of a billiard table. On the billiard table of the Sinai Desert, Israeli tank soldiers have twice waited to Blitzkrieg, experiencing something of the exhilaration felt by European tank crews in World War II. Racing across the Sinai in 67, I was 22 years old, and in four days we got from Gaza Strip to the Suez Canal banks, fighting, moving, all the time on the move. It was a feeling of great power and great energy being released in four days. Power 
and energy in 20th century warfare are most completely embodied in the aircraft. It takes many military forms. As a strategic bomber, it has been used to wage war on its own against the cities and factories of the enemy. The soldier on the battlefield knows it better as a weapon of ground attack and of tactical bombardment against fortified places. The controversial bombing of Monte Cassino, the Italian fortress monastery, demonstrates the aircraft's awesome destructive power and the terrible effect it has on soldiers trapped in a bombardment. One morning, you saw silver fish in the airplanes, you know, shiny in the air. But then all of a sudden, somebody shouted, got a bloody bomb open. You could see them as doors you open, you know. We realized them, you know, they're after us. Actually, you think that that's the last moment we, we, we're still alive, you know? It, it was terrible. We had bombs explode only about five, six yards away from mine. The blast lifted, lifted you actually off the ground and dropped down again. You hate the shops up there. Doesn't matter what nationality is. If it was our own planes, we, we, we would, would have called them bloody bastards in plain English, you know? I, I shouldn't say that now, but uh, you hated them. At that moment, you can't hit back. You, know? you just crept in the hole like a, like a, like a frightened rat. The whole hill, it was just like rubble. You know? It stunk, it, it smoked, you smelled gunpowder, and, and screaming, soldiers, you know, partly wounded or wounded. But you didn't dare, when you, was, when you had a nice cover, you didn't dare to creep out to save, save your comrade because that means your own own life again, yeah? Many, many men, they, they'll be left behind. Well, I, I was lucky I got out. Since the Second World War, another enemy of the foot soldier has taken to the skies, the attack helicopter. Many military helicopters perform workaday roles, reconnaissance or transportation. In Vietnam, the gunship helicopter proved that it could be used as a weapon of pinpoint attack on the battlefield, with devastating effect. A lot of people think that because helicopters are up in the air that you don't get a real first-hand view of what you're doing and who you're killing. Now, that's not true, you, you, especially when you're flying low level, when you're flying at treetop level and you've got an M60 stuck out the side of the helicopter and somebody fires on you, you're no more than 10 feet from you see his head splatter or his, whatever you may have hit. You see it pretty well firsthand. You get an idea of the gruesomeness of what killing is. And again, it never bothered me because I knew I was doing what I was supposed to be doing. And if you let it bother, you'd have big head problems. The thrill of flying the helicopter and getting it to do what it was capable of doing and winning, obviously, you were taking fire, you were getting hits, you managed to take a couple of hits in the aircraft, but at the end, you were the one that won. Absolutely, it was, it was very exhilarating. At about 7 o'clock in the evening of June the 18th, 1815, the Battle of Waterloo approached what has been called its crisis. Napoleon had exhausted all normal means to break the British line. All had failed. He therefore decided to launch the only reserve force he had left, never before committed to action in battle, the Imperial Guard. of the first foot guards describes the result the French he said came on at the double shouting vive l'empereur they continued to advance until within 50 or 60 paces of our front when the brigade was ordered to stand up whether it was from this sudden and unexpected appearance so near them which must have seemed as starting out of the ground or the tremendously heavy fire we threw into them La Garde who had never before failed suddenly stopped those from a distance and more on the flank who could see the affair 
tell us that the effect of our fire seemed to force the head of the column bodily back. The Imperial Guard retreated, and with it, the rest of the French army. With the fighting over, it was time to count the cost. About 40,000 of the 120,000 present had been killed or wounded, and 10,000 horses. The wounded were to be pitted more than the dead. As darkness fell, the battlefield was filled with shrieks and groans of those too hurt to move. Many thousands would lie out on the battlefield throughout the night of Waterloo, some throughout the following day. A few lay uncollected and untended for two days and three nights and still lived. But the majority of those left so long died of shock, loss of blood or dehydration. All the wounded men were tormented by thirst as well as the pain of their injuries. In their agony, they faced yet another threat, death at the hands of looters, military as well as civilian, who crept among the stricken during the hours of darkness to strip them of their valuables and to kill those who resisted. Even if the wounded survived abandonment on the battlefield and the ordeal of evacuation from it, they still had to undergo the torture of primitive surgery at the hands of their medical officers surgery without anesthetics or antiseptics. In some regiments, as many soldiers died in hospital as had been killed on the field. No wonder, as Wellington rode back in the moonlight through the devastation of the battlefield, those who saw him glimpsed no hint of a victor's jubilation in his face. A victory, he said afterwards, is the greatest tragedy in the world except a defeat. The wounded soldier of the 20th century has all the advantages of improving medicine. But as if by some process of satanic compensation, the wounds he risks may be far more ghastly than those commonly inflicted by sword or musket. Wounds and death still remain the price soldiers pay for taking part in battle. I think everyone's afraid of dying. Uh, naturally, whenever you're going to face going off to war, you're going to be fearful of that. I don't think I really dealt so much with that fear of dying as I had troubles in dealing with first being wounded. Okay, I was, I was afraid of being wounded and even made an off-the-cuff comment a few times that if I lost so much as, as a fingernail, I, I didn't want to come home. Well, I lost just a little more than a fingernail, and I'm here, and I've accepted it. But I think the, the thing that I feared more than death and being wounded in Vietnam was being captured and taken as a prisoner. Capture is fraught with uncertainty. These men suffered that ordeal at the hands of the Japanese. The joy of their liberation cannot mask their years of mistreatment. It was an incredible parade because every man there wanted to show that he was still a soldier. Some were bent over on sticks, some were like elephants with beriberi. We all had dysentery. Our feet were two inches thick, like bare feet from yak feet, from tinea, and from ulcers. The troops had assembled on Singapore on the other side of the road to welcome us back didn't say a word. It was like looking at another world. They were booted, they were fleshed, they were probably very thin, but they looked enormous. And we even had a whiff of death about us. And the sergeant major pushed us around, our sergeant major, lined us up until the bare feet, still separating, were in a perfect line. And then he went to Johnson, who was our major, and reported that the company was correct. And he went over to Blackjack Gallican and said, all president correct, sir. And Gallican said, but where are the rest? So he said, they're all here. 
That's what it was. We were the last. We lost 310 out of 500 in Thailand. By nightfall of the 18th of June, 1815, the Battle of Waterloo was over. Perhaps the hardest fought and probably the most decisive, certainly the most dramatic of all battles of black powder warfare. What does the battle tell us about the role of the common soldier, infantryman, gunner, cavalryman? Well, first, that the experience he undergoes has no counterpart anywhere else in human activity. The strains it imposes, the responses it demands fall outside the common and the everyday. Second, that it can nevertheless be survived and that chances of survival are improved by training, skill, discipline and personal courage. But that thirdly, the battlefield is an arena of accident and chance and no soldier, however brave or disciplined, however skilled in the handling of his weapons, can guarantee to himself his own survival. Those who do survive are set apart from the rest of us. And it is their experience that is the subject of this series. The Sinai Desert. In the 1967 war, the Israelis captured Sinai from the Egyptians and advanced here to the Suez Canal. Along the eastern bank, they built a fortification, a series of giant sand ramparts. They called it the Bar Lev Line. They believed it was impregnable. 
For the Egyptian army to retake Sinai, they had to breach the sand wall. Otherwise, tanks could not follow to support the assaulting infantry. Explosive was not the answer. This is the effect of blowing a two-ton charge. The gap is obviously not tankable. Yet in a single day in October 1973, the Egyptians did breach the sand rampart and get their tanks through it. The solution had been found by an Egyptian army engineer. It had a sublime simplicity. Water. Water from the canal was passed through high pressure hoses and away washed through to Sinai. The series of gaps thus made marked the start line for one of the most dramatic armored battles of the last 40 years. The breaching of these ramparts, which are considerably lower than they used to be, and the bridging of the Suez Canal with pontoons was the work of military engineers who opened the way for their victorious army. Military engineers are the men who make warfare possible. They are the builders of obstacles. Here, the Israeli engineers who constructed these ramparts. And they're the destroyers of obstacles. In this case, the Egyptian engineers who cut clean through these defenses. The engineer will be in the vanguard of any army, for a general may have as many troops as he wants, as much equipment, as many guns or tanks, but if he cannot keep them moving forward over broken ground, shattered roads, through obstacles, and above all, across those waterways that cut through almost any battlefield, then he cannot win. It's the engineer who opens the way. Sand ramparts are but the latest in a long succession of military obstacles which the sapper has learnt to overcome. He is also, of course, their inventor. Today, there is the explosive mine, and also a different problem, the blown bridge. Two hundred years ago, the sapper's devices were simpler, but they had their own deadly effectiveness. The hand-scattered Keltrop, which left one spike sticking upwards however it fell, was a cruel menace to cavalry. The chevaux de frise, spikes revolving on a rigid frame, could disembowel attacking infantry. Later armies would adapt barbed wire as a barrier to infantry assault. Sappers were behind all these things. They were also behind their antidotes. The Bengal sappers and miners of the British Indian Army invented the first antidote to barbed wire, called the Bangalore torpedo. It was a pipe filled with explosive, which could blow a gap through an entanglement. Many brave sappers died at the start of the First World War, attacking barbed wire with explosive, until the ever-growing depth of entanglements and the weight of fire covering them made Bangalore torpedoing pointless. In the end, the appearance of the tank solved the problem of gapping barbed wire. The obstacle that replaced it was the mine. The mines developed in the Second World War, whether anti-tank or anti-personnel, worked on the same principle. A thin casing contained an explosive charge, large enough to blow off a tank track or small enough to destroy a man's foot, as desired. A fuse detonated the charge when it itself was activated by a chosen degree of pressure. So, for example, the anti-tank mine would not go off merely when walked on. The fused mine was usually buried, just beneath the surface of the soil, and the digging disguised. At the beginning of World War II, the sappers acquired a tool that would pinpoint the target, an electronic device 
that would detect the metal in a mine even when it was buried. Mine clearing nevertheless remained one of the most dangerous jobs in warfare. You go to the site where the uh, marker, someone had been blown up and commence to sweep for mines with your mine detectors until something buzzed in your ear and then you would stop and your number two would deal with it and you'd carry on like that until you cleared a, a way through. I was afraid, very afraid. Everybody was. The feeling of fear was the stomach was you know, wanting to yawn. And you could tell your friends were just as afraid as you because they were yawning and giggling at silly things. But it was a thing that had to be controlled, because if you're lifting mines and uh, looking for food traps, and you had to control your fear. Uh, you were still afraid, but you, the worst part of fear was waiting to go and do the job. When I was wounded, it was up in Tilburg. We were clearing for, my, for uh, shoe mines, which you can't detect because there's there is only one metal part in, which is a firing pin. And uh, we used to prod for these with a steel instrument of some description. I used to use a German bayonet. And, uh, well, it, as I was prodding, there was just this huge explosion. Blew me back and couldn't see, couldn't hear, knew nothing. In the Falklands, many of the minefields have had to be left uncleared the ground too soft for armoured vehicles, and the plastic mines themselves too difficult and dangerous to detect by hand. C3B! OK? OK. The most common of the anti-personnel mines are these, solid TNT inside, simply fused by screwing the pressure fuse on top of the mine. And sadly, over the last three days, uh, two of my soldiers have lost feet on these very mines. The latest antidote to the minefield, the giant Viper, a rocket-propelled explosive hose, the modern sapper's adaptation of the Bangalore torpedo. of mine clearing are one of the factors which have turned the sapper, like all modern combat soldiers, into an armoured warrior. One of his armoured tools is the mine plough. Others are even more ingenious. 